Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to another episode of Complex Like Wine. I have one of my homies here from undergrad, Luke, all the way from Georgia today. And before we get into all of that, of course, I have to talk about this week's wine. So here I'm holding up the bottle if you're watching on YouTube. I have a Limit, or Limit, however you want to pronounce that, by Camille Benata by from Paso Robles. It's a 2019 red. And of course, I'll read the wine bio and her bio as well. So she's a French native and moved to Napa Valley in the year 2000. And when she arrived in Napa, she started work with Maris. And it was at the time a garage wine made by two mad wine lovers. This made the most incredible wines with lots of passion and the love of wine. When Maris sold in 2008, she became the head winemaker and continued on the passionate wine work of crafting the wines. And then now how they described the wine says Camille captured the very best taste of Paso Robles and put them all in one perfect wine. This red is steeped in a fruity finesse of lush ripe red berry flavors with a mouthful and finish so luxurious you'll be ordering more bottles even before you finish the first one. Starting with a top-notch Cabernet, Camille masterfully brought together a medley of Grenache, Syrah, and even Morvorti, I hope I'm pronouncing, pronouncing those correctly, <laughs> to give this world-class red a cascade of refined mouth-watering flavor. So, all right. Cheers, Luke. You have vodka and vitamin water? Oh, hell yeah. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Really getting the acai there. How is it? I am definitely getting the berry. Nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, do you want to introduce yourself or how we know each other? Yeah. So it's fucking killer to see you. I haven't seen Zyra in, yeah, it's like 2017. It's been like almost four years, which is, it doesn't feel that long. But I um, met Zyra in undergrad, uh, Los Sierra University. I'm from San Diego, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do in college or where I wanted to go. And my dad was a doctor, so I kind of thought I should go the health route. And um, I'm not Seventh-day Adventist. I was never raised in any religion, really. But uh, my mom was way back when, and she and a lot of her family members went to uh, La Sierra University, which is about an hour and a half north of San Diego and Riverside. So I went there and for the first year did nursing school and just absolutely struggled with it. I just, it wasn't, I mean, it's, it's so interesting and I really wanted to do it. Um, but man, I, I don't think I was cut out for it. Um, I, I, I could have passed and I could have kept going, but it's just, I, I was hating life. And La Sierra is such a commuter uh, vibe and like, Everyone goes home on the weekends and like I was, you know, hoping to have a little more of a college experience and also not to talk poorly on religion or anything like that. But Seventh Day Adventism is a very, very small one. And I think um, all of these kids kind of knew where they were going to college in like middle school because you go to like Seventh Day Adventist schools and it's just like everyone kind of knows each other. So I think a lot of those people were like very sheltered. In my eyes at the time, I actually, I don't know, can I tell a story about my first chapel experience? Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for those who don't know, Zyra and I had to go to chapel. It was required. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, did you, you had to go even if you were off campus, right? If you had a morning class, if you had a class before chapel, then you had to go. You had to go. Yeah. Damn. Uh, but yeah, so we had to go to chapel and I was like, you know what? I'm going to go into this with open arms, open eyes, you know, there's a lot of good things about religion. I'm super foreign to it, but you know, community aspect, I think it'd be really good. So I'm not going to go into this like the um, cynical person my dad raised me as. I'm going to go into this open-minded. And I went in and I was like, I'm ready for this. And they're playing um, Bob Ross, the painter. They're playing mm -hmm. like, like, so like PBS, when he died, they did like a video of like where they cut together um, 
a bunch of like they made an auto tune song of cut together parts from his uh, videos and or his show or whatever. And uh, he's just singing. He's like, let's paint some happy little clouds. Let's paint some happy little trees. It's all like this auto tune song. And it's this one part. That, so they're playing. Okay, they're playing the. Let me paint the picture. We're in chapel and they're playing the church and they're playing the pic- this video on like a big like uh, screen. And it gets to the point where he's like, it's like two minutes or a minute in or something like that. And he's like, this is your world. You're the creator. And he's pointing to the painting as he's doing this, obviously. And they cut the video right there. And um, the, pre- uh, oh, uh, the pastor or whatever comes out and she's like, Bob Rust was wrong. She's like, it is not your world. You are not the creator. This is God's world. And I tuned out right then and there. I was like, <laughs> nope. Gave this a fair shot. <laughs> You're like, no, not for me. Uh, yeah, no, I think I just played games on my phone the rest of the time. But long story short, I felt very out of place there for my first few quarters there. And um, I met Rodney, who was our... Um, dramatic was was a dramatic writing teacher in the film chair at La Sierra I just I, I think I showed him something I wrote and he was like he's like I, I think you should try try film for a for a quarter take one class my mom was all about it which is not the traditional parental thing she's like she's like you're not a nurse don't do that like go do film like go have fun like do it for one quarter I was super reluctant towards that at first because I was like ah uh, you know like that's not what I'm supposed to do but um, I did it and I met you. And I, I, I remember the first time I went into the film department and you're there hanging out with Carrie. And like, you're just like, you're like buddy, buddy with your professor. And like, everyone's in like the snack room eating. It's just like, it's like, it's, it was like the band of misfits. And it just felt like it felt good. You know, it was mm-hmm. just like, like I, no one was like overly Christian. Carrie's cursing all the time. Like <laughs> one of the first movies they showed um, dramatic writing or uh, script writing class was um, like her and there's like tons of sex scenes in there I was just like okay this is like I'm feeling more free there and just you know you have Greg who's <laughs> it's just, it's just, you keep he's a character that. yeah Greg is like six I'm six three and Greg dwarfs me Greg is Greg is like six five and just like spiky boots and just you know the most childish humor but he's he's very good at being himself which i just it was fun and it was refreshing and we did film together for uh a year and then i um had to deal with stuff with my health and then ended up transferring but um i'm 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 glad that we came back into contact i Um, know yeah Yeah, for everyone that's listening in luke and i's very first film that wasn't for a class we did together he wrote yeah, he wrote the script and then I was asked to direct it. And honestly, ever since then, I felt like we've created a really great friendship. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Yeah. And, you know, it's one of those things where I feel like we didn't talk for like a couple of years just because, I mean, life overtook. But something that I've really come to treasure over my time in college is, you know, you, you'll meet a lot of people where it's like friendship means exposure. Like you have to see them all the time in order to keep that up. But, um, I think, I mean, I'm 24, so I'm not that old, but as you grow older, uh, you realize just like a friend who you can't, you don't speak to for like a year or two years or just even like a couple months. And you can just be like, oh, pick up right where we left off. Like that's very valuable. So I'm stoked on what you're doing and the podcast is sick and she's up for, she's getting into all these festivals with her film and it's, it's killer. Thank you. Yeah, it's. I've been lucky enough to see that my latest film has been recognized and now I'm glad to be able to do this podcast and to receive good feedback so far. So I'm excited and I'm excited to have you on. Yeah, I'm excited to be on. Tell me a little bit more about um, like how you see yourself as a director now and like how you've like evolved that last year and like 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 what kind of stuff do you want to make going forward? What, what did this, because I just did my senior film. It's a mm-hmm. lot shorter. It was, it's going to be probably like seven minutes. You did a 40 minute film. Like, what did you, I feel like you just went on a journey. What did you learn about yourself? <laughs> so I think my like career growth as a filmmaker through undergrad has had its ups and its downs. Yeah. Our, our first film that we did together, we did it out, like we had no idea, just freshmen. Like, you know what? We have a script. Let's just go to San Diego, film for a week and see what happens. And I'm pretty proud of it, even though there's like mistakes and stuff like as our first film, I'm really proud of it. 
really good as, as a first as a first I, I need to go back and, and, and revisit it because it's it is it looks really good you and Gabe got the shit out of it um is you know we kind of learned you learn I guess on your first one that things matter like casting matters and like things like matter you got to pay extra attention mm-hmm. to like wardrobe and things like that and just like this you know I've kind of I, again, I'm talking about me. I'm so sorry. But, like, <laughs> you know, I came to SCAD and they, they, they teach you, like, very much by the book. Um, and I've kind of gravitated to, like, back to that kind of guerrilla lifestyle that you and I started with. Um, and just now we just know a little bit more. So it's, it's really cool. Like, I, I think about how easy it was working with you guys and that we didn't need, like, a, like a regimented thing. But now I just kind of bring like a little more like knowledge into it and just like, Oh, like, you know, that is important, you know, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So to follow that. Yeah. The first film, you know, did all the mistakes that you do with your first film, which I think regardless, we learned a lot. I definitely learned a lot. And so when it came to my second film, I brought in those learning lessons into my new one, but my second film, I think, I love it with like a lot of bittersweetness because I struggled a lot with that film. You know, my my crew wasn't all completely really supportive. You know, I dealt with a lot of backlash with some of my crew just because of ego or they felt like I owed them. And there's there's a lot of a lot of stuff that goes into it, and that ended up going to. Uh, Carrie, one of our professors, and so there was a lot of backlash that I had to handle with that. And long story short, without revealing everyone, <laughs> I almost was, I was really considering about dropping film because I was like, if this is what it is, I don't know if I'm cut up for it. Like, if this is what I'm being like treated with, with my peers or even professors, like, I don't know if this is even what I want to begin with. And so, with my second film, it took me like almost a year later to actually finish it because I had gone through four editors and they, you know, they'll be excited to edit. But then if it's not their priority of their project, like most people naturally, it's not going to be on their number one list of things to help you with. Naturally, it's fine. So it took me about a little, maybe a little over a year later to actually find somebody to help me edit, compose music. And I think that film's been kind of one of the defining things of my filmmaking career so far is despite all the huge headaches and obstacles I had to face with, I was able to finish it. It's not where I want it to be. There's a lot of things that I wish I could have done differently, but I made the best of what I was dealt with. And so that after I was able to finish that, I felt much better of like, you know what? Okay. I went through a lot of shit with this film. And so now I, know to be more cautious about who I'm asking to help me on my set or how to approach things. And so when it came to my thesis film, long story short, I'll send put the trailer and the link of the film in case you guys want to watch it. But before undergrad, like the summer between high school and senior, uh, freshman year of college, I had, I was listening to Frank Sinatra and his song, I've Got You Under My Skin, they it, it created like a little scene in my head of like of the murder scene in my film. And for four years, I was holding on to it. Like, you know, what? I want to do this for my thesis. So I wrote the scene. When <laughs> you just like, because isn't that the best when you just visualize music like that? You just mm-hmm. like see it so clearly. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Yeah, I like every time I heard the song, the scene would play out exactly like so vivid. And so I'm like, okay, this is what I want to do for my thesis. So I wrote the scene. I sent, I showed it to Rodney yeah. and he was like, you know, it's a good scene, but it's not a story. This isn't good enough for your thesis. And I was devastated. I was like, what? really? Like, I thought it was pretty good. So I was like, okay, you know what? Bet. All right. I'll come back with a script. Yeah. And so a week later I came back with 30 pages <laughs> and I was like, so I wrote the script. This is what I want to do. And so with some revisions, he was like, you know what, this is really solid, like, go on and do it. And obviously, with any project, there were some obstacles I had to do it. But honestly, if like you're if you believe in God, or you believe in whatever you believe in luck, like, 
personally for me, like I have my faith. So I was like, you know what? For whatever reason, the cards are playing. Like they're laying out perfectly for me to make this film. There's like things that would be on my control. Like I have a composer from Spain that found my script and messaged me. He's like, hey, I want to compose this. Yeah. And I told him like, your work's amazing. I don't have a budget. He's like, you know what? I'll cut down my my request of money. That way I can help you. So, so like I mean, you just need a couple people to believe in you and you're just like okay you're right like i have their confidence and like it's funny because like I, I did the same thing like oh this person liked it i've never given them confidence in anything else in my life but they like this so that means it's good i'm like, just mm-hmm. yeah 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 and so i had a few sag actors on my film and like you know what like we'll work with you because we really want to be a part of this and so for me that's kind of like reinforcing of like okay it's People are seeing the value in this and how like the opportunity and like how well it is. So in a sense, it kind of helps me fight that imposter syndrome. And so I'm pretty ambitious when it comes to my projects. I'm like, I don't care. I'm going to make a 40 minute film. So it's just like what you guys did is wild. Yeah. Like we will do a project every quarter, depending on the class. And then our thesis still like they like say they're like, like, like keep it under 10 and like most kids struggle with that so i just Mm -hmm. i can't that's amazing (laughs) thank you yeah we filmed it in six weeks Ah, wow okay yeah Yeah, that's quick too that's awesome though and um most of your crew is from scab or i'm I'm from calling scab oh la sierra pretty much almost all of my crew is from la sierra i worked gabe was my cinematographer again shout out to gabe and Maliki and a few people and then I brought some of like my friends that I trusted to help on it I was able to get eight classic cars for one scene just out out of just being like nice to people so I'm like the car everything laid out as it should be and I think let's talk about the cars because this is something (laughs) very triggering to me I looked for so my senior thesis was a music video and I was trying so fucking hard to find can I curse on here oh yeah go for it trying so fucking hard to find a band <laughs> for my <laughs> artist because like like the the uh the plot is like he's um he's picking up different versions of himself and we just use cam like camera tricks and masking to like just have them all together in different outfits and stuff and he's in like like a van and it was going to be like you know like i was thinking like kind of vw bus but like a like some, something along those lines maybe a bronco or like a like a uh gw um oh my gosh or general motors like chevy like fan from like the 80s and so like i was trying to find something that like they would let us drive for like five days like at the sultan sea and like uh um oh my gosh um yeah around the desert and sand dunes and stuff like that and i couldn't find i tried for like two months or like a month and a half to find this and like i like everyone was like oh like you're 24 sorry you gotta be 25 to rent it mm. or they just like they like weren't comfortable with it or like they, it was stick shift and my actor couldn't drive stick shift so it's just like i i looked in la i looked in san bernardino i looked everywhere i went on every site i posted on all car kit pages and like mainly they just roasted me for not knowing how to drive manual and like, oh my I, God. like, like I, I knocked on like this like where i live in san diego and ob and pl they um there's a lot of classic cars and i just i knocked on people's houses um i ended up like this this guy from germany responded to one of my facebook posts it's like hey i have a school bus and he's like i'm in san, san francisco but if you can't pay for my gas like i'll come like i'll i'll, I'll bring it down and so we shot with a mini school bus. It was perfect. But like, oh, awesome. Had, literally five days before I was flying my crew out to San Diego. So it's just like, man, I congrats to you for finding those cars. I tried so freaking hard. It was tough, man. I I I got lucky because my a church I used to go to every fourth of July, they do classic car show. And so I called the church, it's like, I know there's a lot of people that drive classic cars. I'm a student filmmaker. Can you get me in contact with people? And luckily, I met this gentleman named George who was so sweet. He's like, oh, yeah, me and my buddies, we drive cars and do shows. Like, I'll get everybody and we'll come do it. And I think part of them was, like, happy to have their cars being shown off. But, again, like, with the film, I got really blessed with a lot of different things. And I'm, I think my biggest learning lesson in my career is, 
it's not easy and it shouldn't be. And I'm really thankful I was able to stick it out with my second film because if I didn't, I wouldn't have done my thesis. I wouldn't have been able to win awards or do interviews. So, you know, everything happens for a reason. And sometimes it really sucks during, but when you have the bigger picture, it's so worth it. Yeah, it is. I, I, I totally hear that. And it, it is so hard and it's so stressful and it doesn't, I've done, I think out of my four years here, I mainly did, um, I did mainly producing and a lot of those projects I'll never show. Like I'll just, I'll, I'll never do it. Cause like something happened where the location didn't work out or the sound guy screwed up or the DP screwed up or someone screwed up. Like it's, it's film is amazing because it's so collaborative, but it sucks because it's so collaborative and you're relying on all the people. So, mm -hmm. it's, um, man, I probably had like six or seven projects that I put a ton of work into. And yeah, I, I messed up a couple of them and like I've had, and, and or just something happened where it's just, it's, it's not as good as it should be, or it's just, it's just someone lost the footage or just something crazy happened. And it's just, it's so common that you put that work in and then someone else, uh, like some above the line position doesn't do their job. Um, but yeah, it's it's it it it's definitely helped me know what I'm good at and what I'm not, and through a lot of trial and error. And mm -hmm. I'm good at smaller sets. I think that's you know I I I'm I'm good at I'm good at um, big sets if I'm just you know a crew member and I'm being told what to do. But running sets, I'm very good at small sets. I'm good at finding locations. I'm good at finding crew members and. Um, I think I've found a lot more happiness and I love narrative filmmaking. I love what you do and your, your mind's insane. It's <laughs> the whole you write is so fun. And so just uh, like maniacal. I love it. But um, <laughs> I, 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 um, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm happier when I'm making like documentaries and music videos because it's, I don't know, there, there, there's, there's, depending on what you're doing, there's less to juggle and you can work well with a smaller crew. And I'm finding that just, that just is better for my blood pressure. <laughs> yeah. With anything, I think like with trial and error, like you said, you figure out what you like and what you don't like. Yeah. And also I think with film, like you said too, it's awesome. It's collaborative because you get to work with a lot of really amazing people, but sometimes it's really shitty that it's so collaborative because you have to work with other people. And and as a student too, you don't have money to motivate these people. Uh, yeah. Like that's the worst part. Like if I had money to throw around, it'd be a different story, but like to be like, okay, you have to be here at this time. It's just like, it's tough. It's tough depending mm -hmm. on giving that trust, you know? Yeah. Some of the things, I think another learning lesson I've learned, from observing people from La Sierra and my peers is to embrace being humble because you don't know everything and don't have an ego, like a stick up your ass. Because there's some people that I had to work with and they want to charge you because yeah. they think their time's more valuable than yours, even though you're supposed to support each other's peers. Right. Or they somehow think it's appropriate to like sabotage your project. And oh my Yes. Okay. Okay. It's nice to know. Uh, it's not just here. Yeah. No. Yeah. It, like anywhere. So whether you're creative or any other profession, people out there, like, just stick it out because people with like that have that ego or that arrogance, they burn their bridges. And what I've glad one of the things I'm glad that I've like learned from my projects is what a difference it makes when you genuinely treat people nicely and hear them out and want to work with them. <laughs> No, it's, um, I, uh, shout out to Will Peatman. Will Peatman is my muse. Um, he's shot everything. He's DP'd everything that I've been on that is good and that I will put on my reel. Uh, just about everything. Um, <laughs> but he, um, uh, amazing dude. And he and I are, I, I haven't been able to find a lot of like minded people at SCAD because SCAD is, 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 savannah college of art and design is where i go to school it's in georgia and it's um some of the most talented eccentric human beings i've ever met in my life just really really amazing people but um not always the easiest to get along with sometimes a little overly fragile or just you know very much you know 
been given everything and want it their way all the time. And it's, it's very difficult to work with, but Will and I can like, like, as you said, are nice to each other and have that collaboration where we could be, we're almost like brothers in a way where we'll, we'll argue on a way of getting a shot for like 15, 20 minutes. And he'll like, I'll, like, I'll have it in the script this way. And he'll be like, no, let's not do it this way. And then we'll end up doing it the way I want or like vice versa. And it's just like, when you have that trust and that respect and like you can kind of like just give your opinion then hear it that i think that's the biggest thing about film is like you got to know when to give it and when to not your opinion on like how something should be mm, that's a good point yeah because sometimes you know the director is really focused on a show because like what you did uh finding like a scene to write an entire script about is like that's that's amazing that's impressive you know, i think that's like what a lot of people do but it's also like a trap i've fallen mm-hmm. into a trap where i've just like i have this amazing scene and i try to write something about it or i try to concept something around it and i'm just like like maybe that scene doesn't really work as like a story and yeah. like i'm kind of like trying to jam a rectangle into a circle hole it's just you know it's 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 good to have that you know crew that you probably have found in gabe and people like that where they can you can trust you know that like if you'll fall they'll catch you and mm-hmm. they'll, like no that doesn't work and trust going in that scary direction because it's scary going in the direction that you didn't have in your mind at first you know right yeah i think also another thing especially if you're in the arts that you need to learn how to take criticism you, like sometimes like someone is always going to have an opinion and I think yeah. when it came to like releasing my film I had major imposter syndrome before the premiere and before submitting it because I was like okay I because I've seen it 50 times with editing so I'm like I notice all the flaws I notice everything that's wrong with it and I'm like yeah. no one's gonna like it it's not good people are gonna have opinions and people have but it's like you just have to take it and you can use it like, okay, that's a good point. I'll keep that my next time. But then you also have the right to not always listen to what people say because then it's your project. Right. Yeah. And so much of it is too, is like it's it's, you know, I didn't fall into that trap. Like I'll watch something that's like really good and I'll be like, Yeah, well, they did this wrong to like make my feel self feel better, like that I didn't do that project or I didn't <laughs> that, you know. What I mean? And I definitely worked on not doing that. But I think that's also a big thing as well as artists are so competitive. And that, and especially in film, because like you'll have someone who's gapping for you who really wants to DP and they're just kind of judging the, deep, judging the DP or someone's ADing for you who really wants to have your position. Mm-hmm. And there, it's, again, the collaboration is amazing, but there's, there's all of these things you have to look for. And um, again, I'll say, I'll say it again, but it, like 40 minutes, that's in six weeks of shooting. That's that where you're the director and it's your baby. I, I can't even imagine. I, I'm going to do that one day, but I, that's, that's man. What, what great practice is cool. The last day we filmed was literally the night before we were in lockdown. <laughs> so <laughs> last year at midnight, they said at midnight, you have to return the equipment. And I finished filming by like 1150 PM. Like right there. <laughs> okay, like you said, the stars really aligned for you. Like they really, really did. Yeah. It, it, I got really lucky with this film. And a shout out to my casting crew, whoever's listening. Like I literally could not have done it without any of them. That's like, amazing. Yeah. So I'm really blessed. But anyway, should we talk about what you wanted to talk about? Body positivity. Yes. Let's dive into that. Yeah. What, what I know. You you and Emily talked a little bit about it on your last podcast. We talked about all from like the women's perspective. The women's perspective. What? Give me a little. For, give me a little rundown of where you guys concluded. Or get, get, yeah. So <laughs> you're good. You're good. So for her film, it was based on a poem where right. you know inspired by like your body image. Doc, is that the doc that's coming out that she's about to make? The the little experimental short film she's doing. Oh, you guys are doing together. Okay. That, yeah. that, I saw that poster. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. about body image, body diversity, and kind of the importance of representing that in society. And so her main message is just that flowers are innately beautiful. And women, by association, if you're wearing flowers, you're more beautiful. So it's kind of that like empowering moment of wearing flowers and appreciating your own beauty. 
And what I really like about what she's trying to do, she's only shooting the movie in film. Because there's a sense of like it's permanent. Like these, you yeah. can't go back and edit, like delete a f- file because you don't like how you look. Like it's permanent. And so it's allowing these women in the film to really show their true beauty, their natural body. And it's completely normal. It's okay. Beautiful idea. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sure um, that's amazing. I, yeah, I think there's a lot of emphasis on, yeah, female bus- body positivity. And I think. I think I think there's a miss and I don't know. I'm kind of a feminine dude, so maybe it's just me. But there's <laughs> I think there's a misconception that, you know, girls are the only ones who feel that pressure, which I think you guys definitely are targeted to feel most of it with mm-hmm. the, how they how everything related to the products that are being sold to you or the products that are being sold to men that have women showing them are over sexualized. Right. Realistic figure um i it's something that i started struggling wow words uh vitamin water's hitting me but i think (laughs) something that i really started struggling with when i when i came to la sierra was um a little bit of body dysmorphia and i think i came in there and um i never really watched what i ate i just you know i would just eat whatever and i started getting um, stomach issues started getting really bloated, didn't really know what it was and having trouble moving. Sorry for the listeners. Um, but, and, <laughs> uh, I started just being really bloated and not knowing what it was and not really knowing how to combat that with my eating habits. And, um, I think my second year there when I was fully filmed, I just kind of stopped eating and I was over exercising. Like I'd go to hangar 18, a climbing gym and shout out hanger 18 and um i would uh um climb all day like like uh, until class which is, I, I would wake up at 11 or i'd wake up at like nine go climbing and then go to class at like four and i would climb like all day and I wouldn't eat anything and i'd literally be passing out in carry specs shout out carry spec editing class <laughs> and uh um I want to talk about her at some point too. I'm curious. What she's <laughs> uh, and I just, I, I think, cause I felt so enormous. I looked in the mirror and I saw being enormous mm-hmm. and like have the tiniest little thing. And my situation is a little difficult cause I physically feel it. You know, it's, 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 I think the physical feelings sparked the mental dysmorphia. Um, but like I looked in the mirror and I just felt enormous. And I'm six three, and I was probably like a buck thirty at that time, which is mm-hmm. just horribly unhealthy for me. I was passing out in the bathroom. I was just, just it was, it was, it was bad. And I looked at, um, you know, my peers and like guys who I thought like had you know perfect physique. And I was just like, man, like, I want that. Like, I wish I was skinnier. I wish I was this. And um, I took that into SCAD. And then SCAD just got so bad where I was just, my first quarter of SCAD, like, I was picking the skin off my chicken, like, any little morsel of fat. I was just, like, just, but it was so centered around myself. Like, Mm -hmm. I didn't look at other people and say, like, oh, that person's fat. Like, I didn't, I wasn't more attracted to someone who was, like skinnier or anything like that. Like it was just solely directed at me, you know? And um, I think the ideal woman that is like sold, you know, on the internet and stuff like that, or well, hopefully they're not sold on the internet, but uh, <laughs> is, is just like slender, curvy, and like the ideal man is just very muscular and just built and, and just, just, just tight. And like, I, looking back at photos now, like I had abs, but like, I also just had bone. And like, at that time I felt like I had rolls and I just like, I, I would see that and I would compare and I would see that and I compare and your mind just doesn't really know what's, what's there anymore. And I'm at this point where I'm trying to get my, you know, I have a little more, um, I have a little more idea of what's going on with myself. Like physically I have my muscles, are contracting against each other 
So it's, it's, it's it doesn't really move things throughout my body. So it, it spasms and then it creates bloating and gas. And so like, I try it like not to see that as much. And I'm trying to force food down myself. And like, it's just, it's that, it's that constant war of just like, no, like you're supposed to eat this. You're supposed to do this. And again, like, I don't, I don't, I, I think it's so personalized to anyone who feels that way about themselves. Um, my wow. girlfriend, shout out my girlfriend, is very similar <laughs> to that, mm -hmm. where she um, is literally perfect in my eyes and just about everyone else's eyes. But she'll look at someone who, it doesn't matter if they're bigger or they're not bigger or they're uglier or they're not uglier, but she'll just compare herself to that and think so much lower of herself to that person. It's so personalized. And I feel like there's like, like when I, th I, I think it doesn't matter what you look like, whether you're objectively attractive or objectively ugly or whatever, whatever those things are, those people feel very self-conscious about themselves because of this. Oh man, this sounds so like, like, I don't know. It sounds like <laughs> this sounds so college kid of me to say, but because of this thing that we built on the, on the internet and these expectations that we built. Oh, it's very true. Um, I think it's very easy to like, Oh man, like if I look like that person, I'd feel so much better. Um, and I think people probably point to me and say that. Mm -hmm. and i think people would like like i point to other people and say that where that person's probably feeling very similar um and maybe they don't have the physical feelings that i'm feeling um but it's yeah it's it, it it's weird i think you really have to trust um because there's different levels to it, and I'm talking too much. Sorry, I apologize. Oh no, <laughs> this is your podcast. <laughs> there's, there's, I, 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 there's people who I think like myself who have body dysmorphia who literally see in the mirror something that's not there, and that takes a lot of trust in yourself um, to combat. Because people could be like Luke, like you literally, my mom not PC, shout out my mom, will literally say, Luke, you look like you're in Auschwitz. Or used mm -hmm. to say that, like a lot. Like you look like you're fresh out of a concentration camp because I look so skinny. And I just like, I didn't see that. I don't see that. I didn't trust anyone who would say that to me. I didn't trust anyone who said like, you need to eat. And um, I think I saw, I think what really hit me is um, I got in a healthy relationship and this is not the best advice because you shouldn't put all of your hopes into like, like all of your feelings about yourself into what other people are feeling. Mm -hmm. The person who I got in a relationship with then and who I'm still in a relationship with now after a little bit of ups and downs, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I think so highly of them, right? Like so, so highly of that person. And they think very, very highly of me. And I was able to, build that confidence, but also keep that when um, we, yeah, stop him. Sorry, my roommate's coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when you're not, um, keep that even when we weren't together for a while. And I was able to look back at photos of when I was studying abroad or other stuff. And I saw how skinny I was and I saw how just like at times that I just wasn't eating at all. And I was walk I was hiking 12 miles a day for one meal to combat mm -hmm. one meal. And in my mind, like I thought that was good. Like if you eat this meal, you have to exercise for X amount of times. And I was just killing my body. And um, I looked back at those photos and I was horrified. I was like, I don't want to look like that. And it's just this, it's just this line of like seeing what I think I look like in the mirror and trusting that that's not there. And then seeing what was in the past and not wanting to go back to that. So it's, 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 it's a very weird line to walk. And I think what I would tell caution to people who deal with anorexia or bulimia or stuff like that, um, you feel really good 
for a while. Like it's addicting to like mm -hmm. eat. And like, I even got addicted to laxatives for a while when those were actually working for me because like, I would just feel empty all the time. And like, like it didn't matter if like I spent half the day on the toilet, like I would like, I would like feel skinny and I'd feel light and I would feel like I could perform well until I didn't, until I was passed out in the bathroom because I hadn't eaten anything. <laughs> and I've like exuded all the like vitamins and minerals and liquid out of my body. That stuff, you feel good, but it has irreversible effects on your body. Like I've fucked my metabolism. I really have. Like a, a tall, like man like myself who had, you know, a very, I, I was blessed with genes from my father and just like I, I and my mother, shout out my mother and um, <laughs> shout out Lee, rest in peace. And um, I fucked, I definitely fucked my metabolism by not eating enough and not allowing my body to work. And I think I've just slowed it down so much that when I do eat meals and it's something you can build back up, but when your body goes, and I'm not a health expert, expert, I failed out of nursing school, but when, when, when you, when you put your body under that much strain and, and, and try to starve it and then eat it again, you're just, you're, you're confusing it. And also people don't starve yourself because that that doesn't always work. Like you, like your body's not that stupid. It's it's when you when you stop eating, your body like stores all of that fat. They're like, oh my gosh, we're in a hunger strike. We have to store. We're in a famine. We have to store all of it. And then people are like, oh, like I'm getting fatter because your body's literally eating your muscle, and storing it as fat. And um, I got to the point where I like went past that phase, and I just didn't. I just wasn't eating. And I just got to the point like where like there was no more muscle for my body to eat. And I struggle to build muscle now. It's just, mm -hmm. it's not, it's not something that um, has any positive effects at all. Cause even when you're feeling like there's positive effects, people are looking at you like, Oh my God, like, are you okay? And you have these big divots and bags under your eyes and it's, it's not good. And you're making people around you feel bad. Like I have, you know, I, I think with my eating habits, I think I made my mom and my grandma and a lot of my friends who were mainly female felt, feel bad. Like I was like watching what I eat and like I still do that to a certain extent. And like I eat like a, I don't know, like a, like a rabbit sometimes just because it, it does make me feel bloated but um you also kind of hurt the people around you and i and and, and they feel shamed and stuff like that now i'm getting i'm getting on a rabbit hole mm -hmm. but um that's a whole nother thing but um can i, I think, oh yeah, sorry go ahead. i was gonna yeah, say go can ahead. i ask because when it comes to like the male because like obviously in social media and society it's always plastered everywhere what the ideal female right. body is. Now on the male perspective on that, from as a woman for me, I my assumption is like the preferred male bodies to be bulk to like have this ripped abs and like All ripped. going to the gym. Such an emphasis on the stomach and, mm -hmm. and biceps and, and chest for sure, but like Really, I think, especially now when you have all these like skinny TikTok kids who are like now like the ideal. Yeah. <laughs> it's abs. It's so much on the stomach. And I think that's where I felt like that's personally, that's where I have like the most issues physically. So that's where I see the most negativity. Mm -hmm. um, anyways, continue. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. Thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> what? So from the male perspective, what is what are like? What would be advice to other guys when, if they're struggling with body dysmorphia and, you know, it's mostly only talked about women, that women are the ones that struggle with it, but it's kind of taboo for guys to talk about it because it goes both ways. So what would be advice you'd have for all the dudes out there that are in the same boat or watching what they're eating? Maybe they're underweight, maybe they're overweight. Yeah. Well, you have a lot of guys who are just like, like, I, and I know a lot of them, <clears throat> Who are the gym rats? Oh my gosh, Flem. But they like, they look, they already look amazing. Like a lot of those guys are people I want to look like, 
but it's like not enough. I have to get bigger. I have to get more sculpt. I have to get more tones. And um, if you break that down, it's like, what's the reason for that? And people can say it's for themselves, but I think for the majority, it's like, it's, it's for other people. You're, I mean, the, usually if you're really okay with yourself, then you're not going to really, you're not going to worry about how you look. You're not going to worry about your toning. You're not going to worry about um, what you look like, the muscles. You're not going to worry about any of that. So what that means is you're probably worried about what other people are going to think mm-hmm. and what you can get. And I think, I think attractiveness has become somewhat of a commodity. Like if I don't like this, I can't get someone who looks like that. And that's what I want, you know? Mm. And I, I think that's a big issue too. I think I've, I think everyone's fallen into that. I don't know anyone who hasn't uh, right. to a certain extent, you know? And I think, man, people aren't that picky. Like they really <laughs> are, you know, like it depends on where you are. It really does. It depends on where you are. Uh, I think LA, you feel crushed by that pressure, but man, you go to the East coast and you see some really ugly dudes with some really hot girls and like, it just like, and vice versa. It's just like people, I, 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 uh, it's hard to see that. Uh, so that, what I just said was not, 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 not conducive to what we're talking about at all, but, <laughs> but like, I just like, it's, I don't know. I, I, I just, I, I don't, I don't think people care that much. I really don't. Like I, like I, when you, like I talked about in the relationship I'm in and you're in one too, and I wonder if it's similar to you, uh, but you don't see, you, you, you don't see what that person sees in themselves. You, you mm-hmm. just, you just love that person. Right. Yeah. I think maybe you, maybe you guys start talking, maybe that relationship starts on a physical level. But like, if it stays a while, it's not because of a physical level. Mm-hmm. It's 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 really not, and that's so cliche to say. It really is, but that's the reason. Like, right. you like that person for that person, and if you have a killer personality, you're going to be attractive no matter what. Like, you you just are. Like, like, like it doesn't. Most of these gym rats who I was talking who I was talking about, like, all they know is how to be in the gym. They can't flirt. It's pitiful. <laughs> I've seen it. It's pitiful. <laughs> Like, it's just like, I, you know, I, I want to jump into that. Cause you bring up a really good point. So on like, for me, my personal experience, and I think a lot of girls get this too. When you're like middle school and high school, you know, you'll get teased for whatever physical appearance that isn't like preferred by boys. Right. And when you grow up, you're Another guest I had have had on the podcast, we talked about that. Like, you get bullied by boys, but then when you become a woman, like, that's just how a woman's body is, and you're not attracting the boy's, like, preferred body type anymore. And so, going into, we view ourselves way worse than people actually view us. And, like, with my relationship, I think I'm I'm jiggly. Like, I'm... I'm I'm short. I'm five one. Like I'm not slim. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I think I'm jiggly and like, oh, I'm kind of hairy and like all this stuff. And my boyfriend's like, no, like you're not. He's like, and I love that. Like, but like, your body, like I love you. And for me, with like him, it's like, you know, he's taller than me. You know, like a slim, slim guy. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, I'm not seeing. Oh, it's a slim person. Like I'm seeing him. You know, and how I see with my friends where they might have a guy or a girl, they'll have something to say about their bodies. Like when I'm looking at you, I'm not viewing what you, how you view yourself. I'm not looking at your exterior. I see the real you, your interior. And as cheesy as it is, like inner beauty is way more radiant and powerful than exterior. Cause you might have all the surgeries done. You might be Instagram or TikTok famous, but man, if you're a bitch or you're a dick, like you're ugly, like you're nasty. No one wants to be around that. Yeah, it's not. And I, man, I again, it sounds so cliche, and it took me a long time to say this too because, like, I like, uh, like, I always, I was always kind of confident that I had like a fun personality, but like, uh, 
I mean, not always, but like, I was like, oh, like if only this girl like could see my personality, you know what I mean? Like, like, but like, I have to be like, I have to be good looking in order her, for her to see it. That's then, 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 then I'm not having a good personality. I'm like, I'm not having confidence. And I think that's huge. And I like, I know that's so over, excuse me, played. Um, but my last, uh, relationship like I wasn't I wasn't putting that confidence in there I saw so poorly of myself and that really shows and like I like I um it's not fun to be around it's not it's 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 gross to be around it's it's like you want your person to feel good about themselves because like why would you if you feel good about yourself be with someone who views themselves so poorly does that Mm -hmm. make sense oh no yeah i agree even with like not sorry to cut you up but not even romantic even platonic friends if you're fully dependent on people to make yourself feel better that's not healthy for you or for them it's just draining and you're cheating yourself out like some of the books i've been reading about like self-compassion or trust and intimacy you first have to trust and love yourself before you can expect to do that to anybody or to receive it I don't think I, I don't think I really, I don't think I really appreciate that fully until this year. And it literally <laughs> took my person breaking up with me for me to like, like go and just like, oh, well, I can't have that person be all my self-worth anymore. I got to find my own now, you know? And um, there's, you know, I, I, <laughs> I realize there's a lot of people out there who want to date me and that doesn't even matter. There's, I'm myself am a really cool person. And it just, yes, you are (laughs) getting to that very low point to find that. And anyone who's listening, like that's, there's, there's no excuse like, well, I have this or like, well, like, like I'm like a little chubby or like, well, like I'm kind of weird or well, like I have like a mental disorder or whatever. Like that doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like there, there, there's, there's, it's, it's, there's not one lane to find that self love or that person. Um, Cause I, re- I really do think physical attraction and focusing on physical attraction is about, is about finding a person. It's, uh, it's, it's about like, it's about not being enough for someone else. I think that's no matter how you break it down, like that's, um that's where it leads to at the end whether it's romantic or 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 platonic it's about finding other people and once you realize that that doesn't matter and what what not even that that doesn't matter once you just are okay with how you look or okay with yourself like that just like that that radiates other people and i even find that night tonight like if i'm not feeling good about myself that night or like, I don't like my fit or like whatever, like, like, like I find my conversation skills are worse. My Mm -hmm. conversations are not as fun. I'm not like, people are not gravitating towards me as much. Like, like it's, it's, it it, it can change in just like a split second like that. You got to just really, and it's exhausting to be on it, but you got to, you kind of got to be on it, you know? Right. I, yeah, I'm thankful to have your perspective on it because this is the first episode where I have a guy on. And oh, cool. I yeah. hope to more. <laughs> no, yes, we're definitely doing more. Yeah. What other insight would you give to like girls or other guys out there? Because most of the people watching or listening to this this podcast so far are are women around our age group. And so whole, we got to do a whole other pod on this. Yeah. I know we're already close to an hour. I'm like, oh shit, there's yeah. so much more to touch on. I talk about this a lot because I, I, I was raised by women for the most part. <laughs> my girlfriend's shaking her head. She hates this, but uh, <laughs> uh, shout out my girlfriend. But hey. she, uh, she, uh, 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 98 percent of my friends are um, are women. So we talk a lot about this um, a lot. And, um, dang, I don't even know how to break this down. I think it's, you gotta be patient. I think 
Mm. You got you got to really. I think there's 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 this um, imaginary race to just got to be okay. Got to look good now. Got to have a person. And um, I'm very hypocritical because I'm not always very patient either. Um, but you got to, man, there's, there, there, there's, there's no, you know, quick fixes to being okay with yourself. You got to really do the work. You know, I think I would have an issue like, oh, like I feel really massive right now. I'll look in the like mirror and I'll feel rolls and I'll just like, you know what? I'm going to starve myself. And that leads to irreversible damage. And that mm-hmm. then, 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 then you're further down. You have to, you have to hike up that hill. I, I, I don't think there's, there's, there's all these ways of like, like if I have a job, like I'll be happier, or like happier with myself. Or if I have this, I'll be happier with myself. It's, there's, there's no, like, there's no easy fix, no like result direction to that. Um, I think for guys and for girls, and I'm trying to think where I can wrap this up more quickly. Give me a more specific question onto the guys and girls thing. So, okay, let's. What would be your advice to guys who are also struggling with body dysmorphia? What if one of your homies was like, hey, comes out like, I'm struggling with this. What would be something you tell them? The patients, I think is a really good point because it doesn't even have to be body dysmorphia. It could be mental health. It could be yeah. anything. That's something I'm actually learning right now because I started going to therapy in January. And, you know, we'll nice. touch on the topic. Yeah, my first time ever. And so we'll touch That's on awesome. topic. Thank you. And yeah. I'll be like, all right, I'm 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 good with this. Check the box out. Like, we're fine. And then maybe two months later, like recently, I was having severe anxiety. And intrusive thoughts came back. And I realized with anything, it doesn't go away. You just learn how to manage it and cope with it better and how to process and approach it in a much healthier way. I think that's super important, too, because... I think we that that's amazing that you're doing that. I think you need to acknowledge that there's an issue, right? 100%. Self-awareness. Self-awareness, that's amazing. But I think a lot of the time, once you discover that issue, whether you get diagnosed with something like OCD or ADHD or depression or stress or body dysmorphia, whatever it is, or like IBS in, in, on a different spectrum, you can't use that as a crutch, right? That's yeah. so huge. And I want to do mm-hmm. a whole cast on this because uh, I was um, diagnosed with OCD at a very early age. And if I didn't, if, if, if I had just, if my parents had let me just be like, oh, like that's how he is. Like he's got that label and he's got OCD and he can't, he can't, really we have to avoid those things because those things will trigger him i still be ra- washing my hands raw mm-hmm. like i think I, I i think it's okay to not be okay but it's not okay to not work on it and i think that's the i think that's the biggest thing because i i um it's okay that i have the spotlight dysmorphia it's okay that um i've given into it so much but it's not okay to continue to do that right because i would hide behind my ibs like oh i can't eat that because like that's like like you know that's not um like like that will not improve my stomach or whatever and then i just wouldn't eat mm-hmm. and like, like i would hide behind those things and i wouldn't be doing the work and i still i like i like i'm talking as if like i've kicked it like i haven't kicked it I'll still like chew a cookie and spit it out sometimes because I'm so fucked up in the head. But like, I like, I, I, I it's, it's, it's the constant. Um, my girlfriend, shout out my girlfriend, will make me <laughs> swallow, <laughs> swallow these amazing desserts that we make. Um, and it's, it's, it's just, it's about, it's about not letting those things kind of keep you in place. Right. 
I'm really glad you brought that up because I think that's so important not to let whatever label you have on yourself become a crutch and use as, as an excuse for your behavior. And the, like for me, I when I went to therapy, they the first time they, she diagnosed me with PTSD, depression, and anxiety disorder. And so your instinctive reaction is to be like, oh, there's something wrong with me. Like, I'm going to use it as a crutch. Like, oh, I deal with this. So like, this is just what it is. But I think it takes a lot of self-awareness and a lot of maturity to realize that it is a label, it's a party, but it's not you. And even me, like I I'm, I talk about this podcast and be talking about like, oh, this is what I'm going through and I'm processing. And then the next day I'll be crying and having anxiety because something came up. And so I'm glad you brought that up because with anything, it's always a learning process and the learning how to cope with it manage it and kind of grow with it i think is really important a hundred percent um thank you for sharing that that's you know it's, it's amazing you're doing the work and it's amazing that you're able to acknowledge that um you gotta keep doing the work and i think um again not a quick fix at all but something that i think you can apply to just about anything that's holding you back um because anything that's holding you back has fear loaded to it right mm -hmm. whether it's like i'm afraid that i'll lose my muscle or lose my definition if i don't go to the gym or I'll, i'm afraid that i'm gonna get fat if i eat this cookie or i'm afraid that um i might trigger my ptsd if i go to this party exposure therapy you gotta expose yourself to those things and you gotta just do it and um like i i i like i need exercise to be happy i a couple of days ago i didn't exercise and i was okay like i just chilled and i did homework with my girlfriend shout out my girlfriend and, <laughs> and um and it was all right like I, I didn't feel as good as i did when like uh i exercise a lot uh just because that helps my mind but i it wasn't the end of the world nothing bad happened there's no residual from that and that's just that's such a, a like a you know a small minuscule issue but like it, it doesn't matter what it is it could, it could be big in your mind and i think exposing yourself to what you're afraid of um is gonna allow you to get past that uh to a certain extent or just allow you to to, to just demask that monster inside your head that it's just so scary Mm -hmm. um i think i think once you start breaking down that mask start to build confidence in that situation and then that beams back beams back confidence within yourself and um i think when it comes to when it comes to body image it also just comes to you know like not being good enough for that person so stop i'd say expose yourself to shooting your shot with you know that person you're thinking about or just going out there and doing it and it doesn't matter if you're yoked or not or if you're not if you're not like the ideal body type you gotta just get out there and feel like that, that's okay and mm -hmm. um that's just going to radiate and magnify people to you. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for, I'm glad after a long time, we're able to finally okay. do an it's episode. A formal apology. I have been the worst friend. I've dicked around Zyra so many times. I, um, this is going to discredit everything I'm saying, but like, I do have, you know, I, I, I've been, I've, we've been trying to do this for months and like I've, I've had my senior thesis. I can give you a bunch of excuses, but bottom line is I'm glad I'm here and I'm glad you didn't give up on me. And as we talked into the, at the beginning of the uh, podcast, I'm really grateful for your friendship and I'm grateful that no matter the strain and the years apart, we still have it. And I can't wait to come back and want to do more of these. It's really fun. I'm really proud of you. Mm, thank you. No, I'm when you called me a few months ago and be like, hey, we haven't talked in four years, but how are you doing? I, I'm really glad we were able to just like kind of jump back 
Uh, yeah. yeah and call, call, that's the thing. Go call your friend that you haven't talked to in a while. Go just, just shoot your shot, man. Like I like I was in like when I called you, I was in like my uh like I was in a dark place. I was just like I was like, man, like I I just come back from scattered, lost some friendships, I lost a girlfriend, shot my girlfriend, and I, <laughs> <laughs> gonna have to run an episode eventually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I I just I was like, you know what? I like I want to go call the people who used to make me feel good. And I called you. Um, and I, I think, yeah, don't be afraid to rebuild whatever connection you may have lost or anything like that. I sound like such a preachy motherfucker. Oh, no, you're speaking so much truth, though. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I'm I'm really glad we were finally able to do this. There's definitely a lot more that we haven't been able to touch on. So we'll definitely be doing more episodes in the future. Any any last words or comments you want to share? Oh, yeah. Mention any plugins, anything? Plugins. Um, I will be releasing a music video at the end of this month. And ne- yeah, no, next month, tomorrow, tomorrow's month. Um, called Decay. I will show you a trailer at some point. Um, and what are you watching right now? Ooh, so, uh, Handmaidens, Handmaid's Tale. Okay. That, I, like that. I did six episodes and need to go back. I okay. Just I think back. I think you need to give it a little longer. Yeah. It's kind of in the beginning it's a little slow. Um I watched Dark over the summer. Oh, I dark. Yeah. Yeah. I liked that one. Watched Peaky Blinders again. Really enjoyed it. I'm, yeah. I'm watching Westworld for the first time currently. I'm on season two. I didn't do I didn't do season two, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. What are you what are you watching? Um, man, I got into two things this quarantine, which I think it's over now, um, that I never thought I would, which is anime and reality TV. So I've been doing a lot of that. (laughs) It's just my, (laughs) you know, I don't always have energy for like dark stuff, um, which I love. I love dark stuff, but I've been watching the show, which is actually really fucking dark on uh, Amazon Prime called Invincible. Watch the first episode. It's, it's an animated show. Um, and just just wait to the after credit scene. I mean, if, if that doesn't hook you, then that that's fine. You don't have to watch it. But I've been doing that. I watched some of the Oscar films. Um, mm-hmm. and I just watched that recently. That's awesome. Yeah, it's it's cool because we got hang up. So I'm so sorry. But we've been. <laughs> uh, I, I drive. We I drive like my whole life. We've driven from San Diego to Co- uh, Colorado and stay at a place up there. Um, and like I've just I met so many of those people. Like I've seen, like I saw, like I've, n- I've never met any of those people, but like I saw those people in the film who I don't think most of them were actors. And I was like, I've, like, I feel like I've, I've, I've met this exact same person in another body before. And I've seen that and like we camped along those sites. And it was just, it was really cool um, to, to see that lifestyle. And Promising Young Woman was amazing. And uh, uh, Shape of Metal was also amazing. My girlfriend's saying we have to go. Shout out my girlfriend. But <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, girlfriend, for, for keeping this in check. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you for the viewers for having me on and listening to my monotone voice. And I'll explain the setup next time as well. Yes. Yeah. If you're watching on YouTube, he has a bunch of Nicolas Cage in with him in the I think that needs to be an episode. I need to talk about I need to have my rant about how he's he's one of the best actors of all time. We'll we'll like dive into more topics and you can have your rant. Okay. (laughs) All right. So tune in guys. So for another episode with Luke, thank you again. And we'll see you guys next week. Final cheers. Cheers. (laughs) All right. Thanks guys. Good to see you. Yes. Bye.